This is Vintage Story. If you're not familiar with it, you might think it looks a bit like Minecraft, but in reality, it's a very different game. And while I've seen plenty of folks play through 100 days in Minecraft, doing so in Vintage Story is a different challenge altogether. For one thing, the days in Vintage Story are 48 minutes long, and you can't simply sleep through the night, so I've got a lot of hours of gameplay ahead of me. I've decided to go in with a vanilla copy of the game, no mods, and almost entirely default settings. I've shortened the polar equator distance to make it possible to visit all the biomes, set the days per month to 8 so that 100 days will be close to a year, enabled micro-block chiseling for all possible blocks, enabled soil gravity to make avalanches possible, increased the tree sapling growth speed to normal, why this is not the default is beyond me, enabled the propic node search mode with a radius of 8 blocks, I'll explain what that means when the time comes, and increased the tool mining speed to 300% as an accessibility feature since I have chronic problems with my wrists which are aggravated when I hold down the mouse button for too long. I've set the world seed to Secret Foxfire, capital S, capital F, no spaces, so you can use that to generate the same world and play along if you'd like. I'll also be making a copy of the final world save available to my patrons, along with loads of bonus footage, so check that out if you're interested in supporting me. My goals in this playthrough are pretty simple. Survive the 100 days, make a full set of metal armor, create steel tools, breed all three of the tameable animals, and collect all of the farmable seeds in the game. I should also note that this playthrough is being done on Vintage Story version 1.15, which was the newest version when I started recording. The developers are preparing to release version 1.17 now, which should tell you just how long this video took me to make. Anyway, that should be all you need to know. Let's begin my 100 days in Vintage Story. I awaken on the first of 100 days in Vintage Story. I've got a lot to do in the little time I have, so I need to get to work right away. There's a desert to the south split between slate and bauxite, and a trader just around the corner. Bauxite is a component in making steel, so it's really handy to have some right at the start. It's one less thing to worry about later. I head to the trader, picking up sticks and stones for my first tools as I go. I introduce myself to Hans, who sells food and seeds. Might come in handy later if I get hungry, or when I have broken bronze tools I want to sell. On the map, I spot some ruins close by. I meander that way, making my first flint tools, chopping wood for a fire, and getting reeds to make my first storage baskets. I also grab some berries off the bushes in the area, making note of the raccoons. These guys will steal berries from the bushes, so I'll need to put up fences around my berries if I decide to settle down here. The ruins are big, a whole village of foundations, and the first one is one of the rarer ones. The area is also temporally stable. The green gear at the bottom of the screen there isn't turning counterclockwise, indicating a loss of temporal stability, which could gradually start causing problems for me, like annoying visual effects and dangerous monsters spawning nearby. This will make a good starter base if I fix it up. I dig out the walls and floor and discover, among other loot, a basement containing an aged wooden bed. <gasps> what? What? This is absurd. This is the best bed in the game. It'll allow me to skip basically an entire night even during the winter. This is an absolutely ridiculous find on the morning of the first day. Before you accuse me of cheating, I set the world seed to secret foxfire. Generate this world yourself and you'll see, it is there. I have no time to waste gloating though, I have a lot to get done before nightfall. I reinforce the ruin to keep out the drifters, discovering and digging out a little forge area as well. I put up a nice sturdy rough wooden door. Then I dig up a bit of nearby clay and some peat for fuel and set up a campfire. I make my first torches and light up the base, then make some clay bowls and cooking pots for food and start firing them. Clay items used to be fired in a campfire, but starting in this version, we need to make pit kilns. It seems simple enough. Fill the hole with straw and sticks, stack some firewood on top, and light it. Whoops. Uh, it turns out fire spreads. I clear the area around the pits of anything flammable, and settle into my cozy new bed to sleep for the night. When I wake up on day two, there are drifters outside. I haven't made a weapon yet, so I nap a flint spear, but by the time it's done, the drifters have wandered off. Good riddance. I spend the day investigating the other ruins around the area. There are some ore vessels, which I'll leave for later, and a tool vessel with nothing exciting in it. I do spot some hares nearby, which are an easy early game food source. I find some seeds and set up a hare trap. If you're new to Vintage Story, hares will always move towards most planted crops and try to dig them up to eat them. It's an annoyance for farming, but because their AI is pretty simplistic, they'll walk directly into a trench you dig around one of those seeds and just be stuck there until you drop down and kill them for meat. While I wait for hares, I gather more flint and sticks, and also nab the few copper nuggets I find. It's a good start, but not enough to begin actually using copper. You need 40 nuggets to make the first pick for mining, and hammer for breaking ore into nuggets. While I'm out, I foolishly go underwater for a moment, dousing my torch in the late afternoon. Nights in this game are really dark, so I hurry to gather up some more reeds for another basket, then run home before the sun sets. 
It's getting late, but I sneak back out to grab two hairs from my trap as it starts to drizzle a little bit. Rabbit stew with black currants for dinner. Delicious. Before I head to sleep, I build a makeshift roof over my bed. Don't want to get rained on while I sleep. It's a good thing I did, too, because it's raining when I wake up. I really appreciate the rain in this game. In most games, rain is annoying and irritating, but in Vintage Story, it's really nice. It's like ASMR. I make another hair trap south of the base, then set out to get enough copper to make my first tools. I try panning for most of the day, but too limited results. The odds are just too low. I also break those ore vessels in the surrounding ruins, but there isn't much copper in there either. I do get some coal at least, which will come very much in handy, but I'm gonna need to explore for more copper. In the evening, I realize that my aged bed is actually too effective. The nights in this time of year are pretty short, and by sleeping in the aged bed, I'm missing hours of daylight I could be taking advantage of, so I build myself a straw bed for the summer. Before I go to sleep, I make a raw clay crucible, pick mold, and hammer mold, and set them firing with peat, which is cheaper and more effective than firewood. The pit kilns are still burning in the morning, so I head out to look for surface copper in the desert. It's easier to spot stones here without all the grass in the way. It goes well, and I have enough nuggets before noon. On my way back home, I check one of my hair traps and discover that a pair of foxes have gotten in and killed all the hares. I kill them and cut up all the remains. At least I got some bits of fat and leather from that. Fortunately, the other trap is still full of hares. I gather some more reeds, cook some food, then smelt down the copper and pour my first copper pick and hammer. While they're cooling off, I make an axe mold. I start making an anvil mold, which I'll need before I can make some of the most important tools, like a saw. But I run out of clay, and I don't want to go dig up more at night. In the morning of day 5, I head straight out to get more clay, then finish the anvil mold, as well as some ingot molds, and set them firing. With my shiny new pick, I go out to all the surface copper deposits I've marked and mine up all the ore I can. It goes pretty well. One of the veins is really big. However, one of them turns out to be locked under quartz, which can't be mined up without a bronze pick, so that one will have to wait till later. I also quarry out four blocks of granite to make a quern before heading back. Back at base, I build a wall around one of my hair traps, which is full of animals. I don't want any foxes getting in there, and they'll make a good backup food supply. Then I smelt up some copper and pour another pick and hammer, plus an axe, and make some more tool head molds. It's clear I'm gonna need more coal though, which means chopping down a lot more trees. So the next morning, I grab all my axes and head out looking for a forest. I'm a little nervous, since forests may contain wolves, and I'm keeping my eyes and ears open. Across the water to the west is a handful of trees. The first one I see is a walnut tree. This is one of the new, rarer trees added in this version of the game. It's a nice color of wood, and the seeds are edible. I take the time to break all of the leaves looking for seeds and manage to find three walnuts, which I'll plant back by the base. I also cut down a handful of maple trees and fill up my inventory with logs. Back at base, I chop them all into firewood using some cheap flint axes so I don't waste the copper one, and start my first charcoal pit. The molds are all fired up now as well, so I smelt down enough copper for the anvil. I spend the rest of the day expanding the forge area a bit and smelting more copper for ingots and tool heads. At this point, I realize the first temporal storm could hit any day, so my next priority is making a murder hole. Yes, I am going to cheese the temporal storms. Make sure to write an angry comment about how I'm not playing the game correctly. In the morning, I dig out a proper cellar and make a ladder down to it. Food stored in a cellar decays more slowly, so this is worth doing. With my shiny new anvil, I make a saw. This is one of the most useful tools in the game, since it gives me wood planks, which can be used to make all manner of things like wooden chests, and a proper door for my hovel, which I totally forget to make. Then I make a chisel. This is a critical tool for my murder hole. You see, drifters are pretty mindless, but not entirely stupid. If they know they can't get to you, say, because there's a too wide, too deep gap between you, they won't bother coming at you. However, their pathfinding isn't complex enough to parse chiseled blocks, and they treat a chiseled block like a full block, even if there's only one voxel of it remaining. If I chisel out a two block wide gap between my perch and the edges of the murder hole, leaving only one line of voxels at each edge, they'll walk right in and get stuck. This is much like using trapdoors to trick mobs in Minecraft. The only problem is that the chisel is kind of a nightmare to use for removing thin layers of voxels. It takes ages, and since the chisel loses durability every time you click with it, it breaks before I can finish. I spend the rest of day 7 gathering my charcoal and make a new chisel and a pair of shears for breaking leaves. I also build a tool mold rack to tidy up the forge area and pour my first copper sword. On the morning of day 8, I check one of the hair traps. The crops in it have grown, so I harvest them and replant, taking care to swap the carrots and rye so there are enough nutrients in the soil for each. When I jump down into the trench to grab the seeds I dropped, I get a very driftery surprise. After breakfast, I finish the murder hole with a second chisel. I also discover that the hole is full of pigs, which is convenient. I'll want to start breeding animals before too long. Then I go out exploring for the day. Inventory space is an issue, but I try to grab all the seeds I can find. I also discover that a white area I saw on the map earlier is actually limestone. This is a great find, since lime is required to make leather. 
I'll come dig some of that up later. I do find plenty of seeds, but no flax, which is the thing I need most. Flax is needed to make string and cloth to repair clothing, and also to make a windmill. On day 9, the first day of June, I finally set up a small fenced-in area as a farm. I make sure to use medium fertility soil to get the most nutrients for the crops. They would grow really slowly on low fertility soil. I also finally remember to make a proper door for my base. I need to go out looking for more seeds, but I don't want to wander too far until that first temporal storm has come and gone. And sure enough, I get a warning for an incoming storm while I'm out gathering sticks and saplings. I do some panning of bony soil from the ruins to pass the time. You can find all sorts of valuable treasures in there. Among other valuables, I find a record, which I have no means of playing, so I stash it away for later. When I get the message that the storm is imminent, I grab my spears and head to the murder hole. Unfortunately, it doesn't work all that well. I only get a few who fall in. I also make the mistake of killing some of them right away, forgetting that their corpses will despawn before I have a chance to loot them. I wait till the storm ends to kill and loot the rest, then head to bed. Day 10 is spent fixing up the murder hole to hopefully lure more enemies in during the next storm, and exploring looking for more seeds, especially flax. Unfortunately, I don't have much luck. I head back out on day 11 looking for more seeds, ores, and some fire clay so I can make a bread oven. I go southwest this time. I find a few seeds, then stumble upon a luxuries trader called Rigby. The cart has plenty of storage and even a spare bed, which Rigby gives me permission to use, so it's a good place for a pit stop. The cart even has an echo chamber in it for playing discs. I'll have to bring over that one I found sometime and see what's on it. Right next to Rigby's cart is a huge cave system which tests ultra-high for Cassiterite. That means I'm likely to find tin inside. I'll definitely have to come back here kitted out for a mining trip soon. Of course, the drifters who live here aren't terribly happy about my trespassing. I head further south and find a patch of fire clay. I pillage a few nearby ruins, but I don't find much of use. I do stumble upon my first patch of terra preta, and I grab that. That's the best soil in the game. I spend the night having a sleepover in Rigby's wagon, then start meandering back home, taking ore samples as I go and marking anything promising. I find a few readings for hematite, which is exciting. Once home, I figure I'll plant the new seeds I found, then start preparing for some cave exploration. That means making torches, ladders, fences to block off caverns to contain the monsters, and spears for fighting. But when I actually get back, I'm so tired from my trip that I don't really feel up to all that work. Instead, I use the fibers I've gathered to make my first linen sack, which gives me a little extra inventory space, and build a trench around my farm field to catch hares. If I only had some salt, I could preserve all the meat I get from them, but unfortunately I haven't found any halite, so for now I'll just leave the hares alive until I need them. With that done, I take a break and pan a few blocks of bony soil, but I don't find anything especially valuable. As it's getting late, I realize I still need to plant my seeds, especially the few flax seeds I found, plus the cabbages and soybeans. It's getting dark, but I quickly build a second farm plot for the most important seeds. I spend most of day 13 hanging around the base touching things up. I clear out most of the nearby ruins, make the farm a bit bigger and nicer, and get all my seeds planted. I also harvest the few crops that are fully grown. In the evening, I finally start preparing for a trip to the caves in the morning. Then I make my bread oven. I'm sure I won't forget all about that for months on end. I head out early the next morning. The big open cavern looks a little intimidating, too many places for drifters to get me, but I find a much smaller tunnel close by which still gives me high tin readings and I go down there instead. There's actually a ruin in it just under the surface which contains an old decaying tapestry, another aged wooden bed, and some vintage beef. After dropping off the loot with Rigby, I return to the hole and make my way down. I switch the pro pick to node mode and start searching. This will let me know if there are any ore blocks in an 8 block radius around me. This is important, because the main pro pick mode doesn't actually tell you where the ore is, it only lets you know the odds that the game might have spawned some in a particular area. It's pretty counterintuitive. Sure enough though, node mode does detect Cassiterite nearby. It should be a simple matter of digging a few tunnels in the walls to find it. And then a, a few more tunnels. Wait, how am I getting further away? The Where's the ore? I go through two pickaxes finding the tin, but it is worth it. The vein is big enough to keep me supplied with bronze for a good long while. Not bad for day 14. I could poke my head down a little deeper in the mines, but I spotted some locusts down there, and I don't want to face those just yet. It's night by the time I get out, so I sleep in Rigby's wagon before heading home, kicking myself for having forgotten to bring that disc with me. I head home in the morning and sort out my inventory, but I can't make the bronze just yet because I have chores to do. It's time to harvest crops, set up a new farm area, and replant all my seeds. While I'm in the middle of making a hoe, a sow strolls right on into my house. Bruh. Excuse me. And will not leave. I'm work- I'm working here. Ugh. Oh. Man, what are you even doing? 
What are you even doing, man? She gets stuck on the corn. I guess it's a good reminder that I have a herd of pigs to deal with. I gotta... I gotta give these pigs a place to live. I set up a pen for them next to the murder hole, complete with a trough of grain, and dig a tunnel for them. Oh, come on! Thank you. Thank you. Just because I haven't closed and locked the doors doesn't mean you can just walk into my home, alright? Go have a snack. Excuse me, ma'am. I also free the sow from her trap, but she still doesn't want to leave the house, so I decide to let her stay the night. We'll deal with it in the morning. Yes? Yes! Off she go- no. No! There we go. Goodbye. Thanks for visiting. She finally leaves via the stairs, and I can get to work smelting as much bronze as I can. The limiting factor turns out to be copper. I spend the rest of the day sifting bony soil until my inventory is full and get a pretty good haul. The morning of day 17, I gear up and go visit Rigby again, who won't buy the gems I sifted because they're too low quality. Stuck up, arrogant. No, no, no it's fine. The important thing is that I remember to bring the music disc, and we enjoy a jaunty dance together. Dance with me, Rigby. Join me. There's no time to goof off, though. I have copper to mine. As I'm arriving home, I find a huge amount of copper nuggets on the ground the? right next to my Seriously? base. Seriously? Seriously. This has been here this whole time. Um, um, for believable. The good news is I have plenty of copper now. After setting up some more clay molds to fire, I smelt up some more bronze for tools. I'd consider making an anvil, but I don't actually need that until I get iron. I grab that surface copper I found, then do some chores. Harvest some crops, feed the pigs, chase a raccoon around my base until it runs over a pit kill and sets itself on fire like an idiot. Don't run into the fire! Ah. Oh. As evening falls, I realize I have just about everything I need to make a lantern. I hammer out a copper plate for the base, then combine it with a candle and two clear quartz to make my very first permanent light source. I'm low on quartz though, so in the morning I head to that quartz-locked copper node and mine it out. I also realize I should really start looking for bees of my own. Candles are a pretty rare drop from sifting bony soil. I head east where there are a lot of trees and wander around for a while listening for the bugs. It's pretty peaceful out here. I find loads of seeds, but no hives. At least I don't run into any wolves. Jesus. Oh. Oh. Okay. That was fine. Everything's fine. I'm fine. Holy crap. <laughs> day 20 is the 4th of July. There are no fireworks in this world, though. I'd hope to spend the day fixing up the house, but it's raining and I don't want the torches to go out, so instead I do some more chores. I do a little bit of construction, but it's just too wet to get much done. I do mess around with making roof tiles for the first time, though. I live on top of slate, which is the perfect material. I get halfway finished a small section of my planned roof, but these things take a ton of slate rocks. It's gonna be a lot more work to get a full roof made. In the morning, I make as many fire clay bricks as I can and figure out how to get them fired in the pit kilns. It takes me a few tries to figure out how many to stack. At 12. It's 12. I'll need the bricks for bloomeries to make glass for the windows, and eventually for iron if I ever find any. I can't make too many yet, so after harvesting some crops and feeding the pigs, I set out with a pocket full of shovels. On the way, I stop at Rigby's place. He's finally buying my crappy low-quality gems, so I sell them for 37 gears. Hell yeah. We celebrate with a dance party. Sticky keys. Then I hit my fire clay patch and fill up my inventory. Back home, I start making more bricks, but I realize pretty quickly that I really need more pit kiln space. My base is getting too small for my needs. The morning of day 22, I fight off a bunch of rude jerks and find my first temporal gear. These can be used to set your spawn location, but I don't need that since I live right by spawn, so I save it for now. I can either use it to restore temporal stability, should I ever need to, or to repair a teleporter if I ever manage to find one. Ooh. I have no use for you. Then I go out to shear and cut down all the nearby trees in an attempt to reduce the raccoon population. Raccoons spawn near naturally grown wood logs. Somehow I have not gotten around to fencing in my berry bushes yet, and the little bandits keep stealing my berries. While setting up a new charcoal pit, I decide I'd like to use dry stone walls to fence in the berry patch, and I mistakenly think I need stone bricks to make them. I spend some time quarrying a bunch of slate to turn into bricks. Quarrying is a pain, but once I have the stone, they're easy to turn into bricks with a hammer and chisel. It's only then that I realize I've been looking at the recipe for dry stone blocks, not walls. The walls only need loose stones, which I have in abundance. Oh, I'm an idiot. 
Oh well, the bricks will come in handy later. On day 23, I leave the first batch of quartz smelting in a bloomery and swim over to the west to do some more exploring. I still need more flax, and I'd like to stick my head into whatever cave entrances I find in case there are good ruins or ores near the surface. Instead of a cave, I find something really weird. A hole in the bottom of a small pool of water. Since we still don't need to breathe in this game, and since enemies can't really swim well, it seems safe enough to dive down and take a look around. Okay, I'm going in. It opens into a gigantic, flooded underground lake. It's beautiful and impressive, and most importantly, I find a vein of hematite going straight through it. <gasps> no way! No. <laughs> There's... You gotta be kidding me. I absolutely cannot believe my luck here. Usually, finding iron is a dangerous prospect because it's so deep underground. But since this vein is underwater, there won't be any monsters to worry about. This is the earliest in any playthrough that I've ever found iron. Unbelievable. I'm truly starting to wonder if the developers made a special world seed just for me. But then I remember that I still haven't found any bees. If I could just find some bees near my base, this world seed would be perfect. I mine until my bronze pick is nearly broken, saving the last bit of it since you can sell almost broken bronze tools to traders, although the devs have said that this will be removed in future versions. And then I head home. I load up the first batch of iron in a bloomery. Then I remember that I'll need a bronze anvil to work the iron, so I stay up late smelting 900 units of bronze and pouring it in the mold. Now that I have iron, the logical next step is to work on getting steel. For that, I'll need to make a pulverizer, which requires a windmill, which I still don't have due to a lack of flax. I'll also need a couple pieces of borax to make steel, and I haven't seen any trace of that, but I know it can be found in limestone, so I'll be watching for it whenever I go exploring from now on. For now, I set up a new field using the Terra Preta I found and plant all my flax there for maximum growth speed. I use the flax I currently have to make my final linen sack for my inventory. From now on, all the flax I find will be saved up for a windmill, which requires a minimum of four pieces of linen. That's a full stack of 64 fibers. I work my first two iron blooms into ingots, which is a complicated process that involves chipping off the slag and forming the iron into an ingot shape. On day 25, I'm finally able to finish up making the iron pick. I also make a new iron axe. Throwing the hot tool heads into the water to cool them off is so satisfying, but it's annoying to have to walk over to the lake every time, so I finally make a bucket and bring some water into the base. I gear up with all my axes and head northwest looking for more trees. I spot another trader on the way, but their wagon didn't spawn with a ladder, so I can't get in there to talk to them. How the heck do I get in your wagon, dude? What? Where's your ladder? You kidding me? It's right by a pine forest, but it looks like it might be wolf country, so I proceed with caution. Eyes and ears open for any threats. Any wolves out here, just... just watch out, okay? I got a sword, and a very vague idea about how it's used. Then I become distracted almost immediately, because I spot another set of ruins. A whole village worth. I came here for wood! They're full of loot, too. More than I can carry. So much for gathering wood. I'll have to head back home to unload. I also spot more white stone to the north that looks like either limestone or chalk. I'll have to come back to investigate that soon and see if I can find any borax bits on the ground. As I arrive back at the base to unload, I'm struck by what a hideous, half-finished mess this base is. I need to do something about that soon. So the next day, I get up determined to spend some time fixing the place up. Unfortunately, an impending temporal storm puts those plans on hold. I get some chores done while I wait for the storm to arrive. When the time comes, I gear up and head to the murder hole. The new design works a little too well, and I actually get hit a couple of times. Fortunately, I thought to bring walls with me, so I block off three sides so I can focus all my attention on one direction. Some of the high-level drifters can take most of my health in one hit, so I need to be careful. Fortunately, the storm is fairly short, but my pit is loaded up with so many drifters I break one of my spears killing them all, and a knife cutting them up. It isn't even worth it. All I get is a handful of flax fibers and two rusty gears. The next day, I finally get to work fixing up the base. I lay out an expansion to the south, which incorporates my reserved larder of animals. For now, the floor is packed dirt, and I use dry stone walls to fence it in with slate cobble slabs for the ceiling. This will be my new pit kiln and smithing area. I keep working on it the next day, moving all the clay firing stuff out there and finishing up the roof. Then I go around chopping down the new trees that have sprouted up. I realize I still haven't gotten around to fencing in my berry bushes, which is a terrible mistake. I start gathering them up to put in a new area for protection. Then I move all the metalworking stuff to the new area before bed. On day 29, I realize I have a small pile of animal skins I could be turning into my first bits of leather. I have everything I need to do so. I also realize I have enough flax to make the windmill, but I need more animal fat to make the gears and axles to make it work. 
My sows are all pregnant, and when they have their piglets, I can slaughter the adults, which should give me plenty. I rotate the fire clay bricks in the pit kilns, then I head west again to get my limestone, keeping an eye out for borax as I go, but not spotting any. Naturally, I stumble upon yet another ruined village, because this is the world seed that just keeps on giving. I manage to save enough inventory space for one stack of limestone alongside my loot, and back home I grind it up into lime. Water and lime in a barrel makes lime water for soaking the skins, the first step in making leather. I also throw some oak logs in some other barrels to start the process of making tannin. The next day, I finally make a quick fenced-in area for my berry bushes. It's already too small, but it'll do for now. Summer will be ending soon, and once it gets too cold out, the bushes will stop bearing fruit. I head out north to check out that area of white stone, which does turn out to be chalk. On the way there, I also grab the rest of the loot from the ruins I found. Then I fill up my inventory with chalk rocks to make more lime. I poke around a bit looking for borax, but no luck. I wish I thought to bring a prospecting pick. Back home, I start making some more iron tools. Now I have an iron shovel, shears, and a spare pick. I'll need to cast a new hammer soon as well. The bronze ones wear out kinda quickly, but I don't want to make an iron one until I have plenty of iron to spare. At this point, I decide I can't keep living in this ramshackle mess. I have a vision. It's time to roll up my sleeves and get my base properly fixed up. I spend days 31 through 33 crafting, building walls, installing windows with what glass I have, moving things around and creating a proper storage area, walling off rooms and giving them doors, placing lots of path blocks to make it easier to get around, and finally putting up the roof, which is a lot more work than I expected and takes several days to finish. It took a bit of work to figure out how all the roof pieces fit together too. I also go down and dig out a much nicer basement. I still need to finish the windows though, so I make a run for quartz and get that smelting before finishing up the rest of the build, including a central outdoor kitchen area. On day 34, I put the finishing touches on the base. I'm pretty happy with it. I'm still lighting everything with torches though. I catch up on some chores, then make myself a nice little sifting spot, and settle in sifting bony soil until late at night. Some of the neighbors come by to complain, but I ignore them. I wonder if these bones belong to any of their relatives. What's up, these are your grandma's bones? You can't touch me. You tell them, raccoon. I don't get an amazing haul from the sifting, but I do have two more candles now. I need to turn them into lanterns. On the morning of day 35, I take a good look at my finished base. I didn't do too bad, I think. I have an expanded berry area, a bedroom to sleep in, a storage room for all my stuff, and a little attic area to expand into later. I head out for the day to go mining and dig up some of the ore I have marked to the north. On the way, I stop by that trader whose wagon doesn't have a ladder and find them standing outside it on the ground. Turns out to be a commodity trader, potentially very useful. I think they might eventually sell borax if I'm lucky. I grab some copper and a tiny bit of lead, but not really enough for making a lot of lanterns. I wander a bit looking for more, but it's getting late already and it's time to head home. It's September now, and the days are getting a lot shorter. It's dark well before I get back, and if you were wondering why I don't just go out exploring and such at night, well, it's pretty hard to see where you're going. The nights are really very dark in this game. Back at base, I make a new iron pick and knife while the neighbors moan loudly at me from the other side of the fence. Now that it's getting colder outside, I start preparing to take a long journey south. I finally remember the bread oven and start baking bread to take with me. This involves grinding grain into flour at the quern, mixing it with water to make dough, loading the oven with firewood and burning it to heat it up, then loading the dough inside to bake. It's a complicated process for a simple and not very nutritious food, but I enjoy the immersion, and since bread is stackable, it's a convenient travel food. You can actually watch the bread rise in the oven. While I'm playing with the oven, I also learn the difference between baked and charred bread. Charred can be cooked in a campfire and has a lower nutrition value, but it also lasts for a lot longer. I decide to make both to take with me on my journey. I also remember that we can now make pies. It turns out they're a good way to preserve fruit for the winter since they last 30 days in the cellar. Fruit spoils pretty quickly, and previously the only way to preserve it was to make jam with honey, a resource-intensive and frankly odd way to consume fruit since you can't combine it with anything. You just eat it out of the bowl. Pies are definitely the way to go. In between batches of bread and pies, I also smith up two Molybdichakas plates for lanterns. This alloy is a mix of lead and copper, and it's far more attractive color for a lantern in my opinion. So why a journey south? This version of the game has a lot of new crops and trees, but most of them can only be found in tropical climates. I also remember that wolves can't spawn in warmer areas. Any block with a base temperature above 15 degrees Celsius will not spawn wolves. Based on my past experiences with worlds of this size, if I head about 2,000 blocks south, I should be totally safe from wolves. Then all I have to do is wander around a forest until I find some bees. The plan is to locate some bees and set up a skep, then head further south to look for new crops for a few days, and then come back north when I know the bees are ready to take home. I'm just about ready to go on my trip south by day 37, but I want to wait for the next temporal storm first. In the meantime, I do some chores, harvesting crops, and making a new charcoal pit. I'm still waiting on day 38, so I take a trip through the rain to Rigby's wagon to try to sell some of the junk I've found sifting. 
Unfortunately, he's not buying, so it's just a social visit. I also take another trip to the underwater iron mine. I can't help taking a moment to marvel at the beauty of the autumn colors as I make my way there. This game, man. Gorgeous. I'm a bit nervous about mining this time, since my old torches have long since burnt out and I didn't think to bring any new ones. Now that the area is mined out, high-level drifters could theoretically spawn here in the darkness. I just grab a stack, then get out of there, though I do take a few minutes to explore more of the underground lake to see if there are any other valuable resources here. Alas, nothing but quartz. On day 39, my first batch of leather is done, and I get 11 pieces total from it. I decide to use 8 of it to make a backpack for myself, giving me one extra inventory slot over the linen sacks. I'll need all the space I can get, since I'll have to leave one of my containers behind to make room to carry the populated skep back home at the end of the journey. I spend the rest of the day playing with the pie baking system. I figure out you can set the top of the pie to be a variety of different patterns, or leave them open to bake them if you want to use less dough. I also figure out that I can mix different types of berries together, or different types of vegetables, or fill a pie with meat, but you can't mix different food groups. This is really disappointing. I wanted to make some hearty pasties with meat and vegetables for the road. I know the devs have probably left this out intentionally to prevent any one food type from being overpowered compared to the others, but it's really immersion breaking for me. Who makes a meat pie with no vegetables in it whatsoever? It also means that if you don't have enough of a particular type of food to fill up a whole pie, you can't bake it unless you get more before it spoils. On day 40, the temporal storm warning finally appears. I spend the day fencing off some of the yard and lighting it up a little bit with some of the oil lamps to hopefully cut down on the drifter spawns each night. Then I make a new charcoal pit. I go through that stuff ridiculously fast making iron. In the evening, I head to the murder hole for the storm. Unfortunately, this storm seems to be bugged somehow. A few normal surface drifters are already in the hole before the storm begins, but then no new enemies spawn the whole time. I just stand there feeling foolish. Oh well. Once the storm ends, I take care of the few surface drifters, which yields no loot whatsoever, then start getting ready to head south as soon as the sun comes up. Dawn arrives, and after saying goodbye to my base, it's time to go. I check my gear, and I set out southward. I try to avoid wooded areas out of fear of being eaten by wolves. If I'm killed far from home, I'll drop all of my gear, which would be, uh, bad. It would be bad. Unfortunately, it's not nearly as long a journey as I expect. Before nightfall, I've passed the threshold beyond which wolves should not be able to spawn. I set up a little shack on an island to spend the night, then poke around a bit. There are plenty of trees around, and I see soybeans growing wild, which is usually a good indicator that bees might be found in the area. There's no time to find them tonight, though. I don't want to be dealing with drifters in a strange forest, so I throw together a makeshift door and a fire starter, since I didn't think to bring a torch. It's dark by 6pm, and I head to bed, and it's still dark at 4am when I wake up. I have some time to kill before the sun rises, so I sit at the bottom of the lake contemplating whether my people have gills or just absorb oxygen through our skin. Fortunately, the sun is up earlier than I expected. The game actually takes your latitude into account when determining the angle of the sun and the length of days and stuff. It's neat. I find some bell pepper seeds as I walk through the forest. These aren't properly in the game yet and can't be planted, but I grab one for completionism's sake. After that, it doesn't take too long before I hear the beautiful buzzing of a hive of bees. I set up the skep and surround it with the flowers necessary to get the bees to swarm into it. Looks like it's going to take 8 days for that to happen, which will be November 2nd, so I have plenty of time to go further south and find goodies before I come back to get them. I gather up my belongings, leave my mark on a stone wall with some chalk, and then get going. Further south I find some amaranth plants which give me grain and seeds, then stumble upon a redwood forest. I stop and try to get a sapling, but to no avail. I settle for marking the forest on my map, knowing I can come back anytime if I want the wood. It's getting late, so I keep moving south. I spot peridotite stones on the ground, indicating that the rock layer below the soil has changed. Peridotite is a lovely green stone which, more importantly, contains patches of olivine which can be used to make green glass. I make a note of that for the future as well. I walk until it's too dark to continue, then sleep up on a platform while the drifters complain below me. The next morning I immediately find sunflowers, another of the new crops, and I get some seeds. Further south I find a cypress tree and grab some of those seeds as well. These would make a really nice decoration. Before too long, I've reached the jungle. I get a few kapok seeds immediately, then find and shear an entire purple heart tree, one of the new rare ones, and I only come up with one seed from it. These have a gorgeous purple wood and are really hard to get seeds for to propagate. I hope I'll be able to spare the inventory space to carry some of the logs back with me. I also grab some rice seeds and bamboo saplings. The jungle is generous, but there's still plenty more to find. On my shopping list are peanuts, pineapple, and cassava. I set up a temporary base platform to sleep on. Heading into the bamboo jungle the next morning, I find peanuts right away. After a full day of wandering, I see plenty of beautiful flowers, which I won't have inventory space to bring home, but there's no trace of the pineapple or cassava. I do find a trader selling building materials in the middle of a jungle, but 
they don't really want me to stay, which is disappointing because I have a lot of questions about how this wagon even got here. All right, I'm going, I'm going. Sheesh. On day 45, I head west and south. I eventually find another trader, a treasure hunter. These are really handy traders to have around, but this one is not in a handy location. I find several patches of pineapple and even more peanuts, but still no cassava. I don't find any the next day either. I do find loads of ruins, but I have to ignore them. I just don't have the inventory space for more loot. I wonder if I'm looking in the wrong place. Maybe cassava doesn't even grow in the jungle. The developer's notes on them just say they grow in hot climates. Maybe I need to be looking in the savanna, where the acacia grows and the hyenas roam. On day 47, I try heading into the drier areas in the region, and I find plenty of cassava with little effort. There are loads of hyenas out here, but they're not nearly as aggressive as wolves. I give them their space, and they don't give me any trouble. A ways to the south, I find the ruins of an enormous building. I dig the entire thing out. It looks like it would be great to fix up and turn into a base, maybe even use it as a winter home. 200 days in Vintage Story, Tropical Edition, anyone? It does occur to me that these tropical seeds I'm gathering won't grow at my base over the winter, though. It might be worth making a little farm here, planting all the seeds I've found, and coming back for them later when they're full grown, especially since some of them take a really long time to grow. I do just that the next day with the cassava and pineapple, which will take most of the rest of the series to grow. I make a little kapok fence for them, even though I'm pretty sure there are no hares in the jungle to steal the seeds. I now have everything I came for, but a bit more time to kill, so I spend the rest of my time here searching for more purple heart seeds. I do manage to find a handful, despite the wind making it very hard to know where to aim to break the leaf blocks. I'm gonna miss the jungle. It's really quite beautiful here, and the warm weather and long days are gonna be hard to leave. But I miss my pigs and my murder hole. Oh. Okay. 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 Yep, yeah, that's fine. No, that's fine. Sure. Uh huh. Shut up. As the sun sets, I get my inventory sorted out so I can start running north first thing in the morning. Day 50. I've reached the halfway point already and it's time to run home, stopping only to grab my populated skip. I'm making such good time now that I know exactly where I'm going that I think I can actually make it all the way home in one day. I can't wait to see my pigs. I wonder if they've missed me. <gasps> Unfortunately, the skep isn't ready after all. Turns out the game has a very nebulous way of calculating time and I have one more day to go before I can take it. I'm heartbroken. I have no other plans for this day. I kill time wandering around, checking out the nearby ruins and stealing their bony soil, and I do find some terra preta, but there's nothing else to do, so I settle in to sleep through the night, hoping my skep will be ready in the morning. In the morning, the bees are ready and I pick up the skep, then stand around waiting for it to be light enough to navigate my way home. Bees! Once the sun is up, I set out northward. As I approach the house, I'm delighted to find that my sows have given birth and I have a whole little herd of squealing piglets. Babies? <laughs> Babies! Awesome! It's also gotten pretty cold while I was away. It is November, after all. Some of my crops have already withered in the cold, but most of them are hanging in there. I put away all the wonderful things I brought home, put a campfire in the corner of my bedroom in case it gets really cold, and then stay up all night panning the bony soil I brought home and grinding up flour to make pies with the final berry harvest. The morning of day 52 is cold and snowy. I really have arrived home just in time for winter. I bake lots of pies to use up the rest of my fruit, which could otherwise only last a few days in storage. Then I clear out an area of the back of the house and fence it in for the bees. I don't set them up yet, though. I'm not sure how the winter cold will affect them, and I want to build an enclosure for them, just in case. I go pay the pigs a visit. Now that I have plenty of piglets, I don't need all these adults taking up space. What I do need is meat for pies and fat for lanterns. I set up the skins to start soaking in lime water and some more glass and bloomeries. Then I stay up all night baking. There's just something so comforting about watching them rise in the oven. Then I reorganize the basement and add some shelves, though I'm disappointed to discover that the pies can't be placed on shelves like bread can. Oh well, at least I have plenty of pies. These ought to get me through most of the winter, which is good because I don't think my crops are going to grow any further this year. The morning of day 53, while I'm in the middle of baking some bread, I get an incoming temporal storm warning. I'd forgotten all about the storms while I was away. It's lucky I didn't get hit with one unprepared. After putting the bread on the shelves in the cellar, just because I think it looks nice, I spend most of the day building a little house for my bees, complete with a skylight, and get them set up with flowers. Indoor spaces get a temperature bonus, but I have a feeling it probably still won't be enough for them to swarm until spring. Then it's time to head to the murder hole. It's pretty uneventful, and I only get surface drifters. There's a good- where you going? Part is over here, man. I've been talking about setting up a windmill for ages, but I keep putting it on the back burner. It's time to fix that. 
After harvesting the few crops that have managed to grow and saying hi to a cute little fox has found its way into my yard. How'd you get in here? I make all the parts, using the last of the animal fat from the pigs to make the axles. I decide to go with these dry stone blocks for the walls. It's such a beautiful block. I get it partly built before sunset, then spend the evening making some new iron tools to replace the ones I almost broke on my trip south. Then on day 55, I finally complete the windmill. It's glorious. It's beautiful. It's not moving. There's no wind. My next plan is to put those poor pigs inside. I can't just leave them out in the snow like that all winter. I spend day 56 shearing and cutting down all the trees just south of the house, then start digging out loads of peat to replace with dirt to serve as the foundation of the barn. I'm set for life on peat, I think. It takes a lot more time and a lot more dirt than I expected, but on day 57 I finally have a flat space to build on and start laying out the barn's shape. Partway through the day I discover that the fox I saw the other day has somehow made its way into my larder and killed one of my hares. That's what I get for leaving the doors open when I go outside. It's a real pain, but I managed to kill it without angering any of the boars, who'd be able to do me a lot of damage. While I'm cooking up its meat, I notice that the windmill is actually turning. I'll want to upgrade those sails as soon as possible to make them more efficient, but at least my windmill isn't totally useless. Day 58 is a proper snow day. I love how snow piles up and covers everything. <gasps> snow! Huh? This is also the day that I learned that fallen snow can stack up to half a block tall, which is high enough to allow mobs to climb over fences. How are they getting in here? Guess I better add snow shoveling to my list of chores. I've decided that I don't like the layout I've made for the barn and tear it all down to start over, but this time I have a clearer vision in mind so I make much faster progress. I get all but the roof and interior done in one day. I'm gonna go with cobble for the roof instead of roof blocks because roof blocks are a little too steep for what I have in mind. I'll need a lot of stone for that though, so I do a bit of mining before bed. The morning of day 59, I actually have to shovel some snow to get out the back door to go check on my bees. I shovel the snow. They haven't made much progress, unfortunately. Then I spend the day putting the roof on the barn. The whole building is complete just after sunset, and I can start moving the pigs in the next morning. I go to give them the good news and discover that all the piglets are all adults already. They grow up so fast. It's tempting to slaughter some of them for more fat and leather, but I'd rather wait until I breed them all once first. Now, some of you veteran vintage story players might be saying, Ari, if you need fat and leather, why don't you just go hunting? There are tons of animals all over the place. Just head a little ways away from your base and you'll find more animals than you know what to do with. Well, good viewer, there's a very good explanation for that. I just straight up didn't think of it. Anyway, I used some tin bronze to make a lantern for my last candles and some out of Melinda chocos. This one will go in the barn. I then spend the entirety of day 60 getting the dang pigs in the barn. These idiots are an absolute nightmare to move. It actually would have been easier to move them as piglets, since they always run away from you and you can just herd them in. As adults, there's no way to reliably move them. The game doesn't have leads or anything like that yet, although the devs are planning it for a future version. Ah, oh, crap. For now, your options are luring them with food in troughs, which is very slow, or hitting them and getting them to run, which is very dangerous, because you don't know whether they'll run away from you or turn to attack you and chase you, and they do a lot of damage when they hit. Come to think of it, I should really start making some armor soon, shouldn't I? Anyway, I opt for the slow but safe method and nearly lose my mind doing so. You're going the wrong way. Other way. Shoo. Yes, yes, yes. Go to the free food. Go to the free food. You're so close. Come on, last one. Last one, get in there. Wrong way. God, this is so stupid. Pigs are not this stupid. Pigs in real life are intelligent. You're a terrible example of your species. Please, yes, 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 yes! One more step, two more steps. Yes! Success! Pigs entrapped. What? How did you get out? No! Back in! No, 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 no! Oh! You will be in that barn by morning young lady. Sorry, I gotta leave the doors open, everyone. Your friend's an idiot. The morning of day 61 is really cold. I check on the pigs and start moving them over to their permanent pen, then head out across the now mostly frozen lake in search of sheep. There's no way I'll be able to get milk or cheese with the time I have left, but I'd still like to have some sheep. And some chickens, eventually. I use the trough method of luring sheep towards my base. I set down two troughs in a line, a short ways away from each other, put one piece of grain in each of them. Once the sheep targets the first one, it'll keep walking towards it even if it disappears, so you break that one and place it further away. When the sheep realizes there's no food at its destination, it's still hungry, so it retargets the next one, and you can leapfrog down the line until you reach home. I'm making good progress when disaster strikes. 
One of the sheep attacks me out of nowhere. Oi! I didn't do nothing to you. It probably fell and took some fall damage, then blamed me, because their AI is... Uh-oh. Not the best. It very nearly kills me, but I managed to survive by jumping into the freezing cold water and swimming away. Oh. Now I'm wet. I take cold damage as well. This is not going according to plan. Looks like I'm not getting any sheep today, so I spend the evening getting the pigs settled in their permanent pen. The nights are so long this time of year, it's always still dark out when I wake up. Day 62, I do my shoveling and check on the bees, who've totally stopped progressing. I shovel off the snow on the roof so that at least they can get a little sun. I'm killing a few drifters taking shelter amongst the pigs in the barn when I realized I haven't actually seen any drifters around outside lately. It looks like they won't spawn on blocks that have snow cover on them, so that's handy. I don't miss their moaning. I spend most of the day finding a single ram across the lake and slowly leading it home. One down, but he needs at least one mate. There's a temporal storm warning in the early hours of day 63. I decide to risk going out to find more sheep anyway and hope I make it back before the storm hits. I make it most of the way before the imminent storm warning appears and I run to the murder hole. It's a rough storm this time, lots of high level drifters, but the murder hole keeps me safe. Meanwhile, I can see that the sheep are sticking around for now. Good morning. I don't want you to be here at all. Jesus. Day 64 is the last day of the year and I wake up to a tainted drifter outside my window, a remnant of last night's storm. Absolutely terrifying, thank you. While I kill it safely from up on my walls, I spot all the sheep I'd been trying to herd the day before just strolling right into the barn. Brilliant. Unfortunately, they don't cooperate very well beyond that, and it takes the rest of the day getting them into their permanent spot. Get inside. There's no food out here. Why are you out here? Ah! Now I just need chickens. Day 65 is January 1st. Happy New Year. I wish I'd planned something fun to do, but I have a lot of chores and responsibilities to focus on. I make a new axe and a long overdue iron sword. Then I check on the animals, feed them, and tidy up the barn. It's gonna be tough getting all these animals pregnant over the winter since I'm low on grain. I cut down the last maple trees that have grown, and though I replant the seeds, I know they won't grow till spring. Then I start working on a chicken coop. I work into the night, not terribly worried about the drifters anymore since it seems like they don't like spawning on the snow. I use some newly processed leather to make a second backpack, then gather up grass for a thatch roof to finish the chicken coop on day 66. Gathering grass in the winter is a real pain since you have to dig it out of the snow first. The heavily falling snow soaks through my clothing, and mid-building I actually start shivering. It's really cold out and I don't have any warm clothing. I take a rest inside my bedroom by the campfire and warm up before finishing the job. I think the result looks pretty nice. Now I just need to actually find some chickens to live in there. I make some more tools in the morning of day 67, then head out in search of chickens as soon as it's light enough to see. I forgot that chickens are actually really easy to herd since they always just run away from you. It's pretty easy to get a handful of hens and a rooster inside the pen, but a little more difficult actually getting them in the coop. I don't want them outside during the winter because there's a risk of them using the snow to escape their pen. I put some food inside the coop to lure them in and build up the fences so they won't escape, then I check on the other animals. My ewes are both pregnant, which is great news. I won't need to feed them anymore this winter. On day 68, I remember I have some honeycomb in the basement which I found in a loot vessel. I squeeze out the honey and use the wax to make a candle, which I put in a lantern for the chicken coop. I realize it's a little cramped in here, not much space for food, so I build a little extension for more food trays. Then I spend the rest of the day shoveling and cutting grass to feed the pigs, most of which are ready to mate. I can't believe it's already day 69. Nice. It's another day of mostly gathering grass for the pigs though, which isn't terribly exciting. I butcher up one of the boars from Generation Zero, not without a small amount of chaos, since uh -oh. I really only need one boar. I set the leather processing and hold on to the fat for now. I'm not sure if I'd rather use it for lanterns or more axles for the windmill. On day 70, I finally get started on a set of armor. I'm going with Iron Chain since it seems to have a good balance of protection compared to its drawbacks. Armor in Vintage Story is a real trade-off. It makes you move more slowly and increases your hunger rate in exchange for taking less damage from enemies. Anyway, a full suit of chain armor requires a ton of leather and 20 iron chain, each of which is made from two iron ingots. It's a big project, but it should be doable. I make more bloomeries for iron, get some more tannin processing for leather, and make my first piece of iron chain. It's a lot of work. This is gonna take a while. I'm noticing that the sun is coming up a bit earlier each day. I feed the animals, giving my carrots to the pigs so I don't have to spend all day gathering hay, then get back to worth smithing. I managed to create four more iron chain, bringing me up to five total. A quarter of the way there. I'm getting low on coal, though. So on day 72, after giving the pigs some onions, I head north to chop wood. Hey, come over here. I can't... I'm not allowed to... Your ladder's missing. Excuse me. You have a customer. Hello? Hey. Come closer to over here, please. Ugh. 
I need borax. Do you have any bor? Excuse me. Do you have any borax? How far away do I need to go? Hey. Hey, 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 wait. Hey, what? Oh, dude. Hey, Aram, do you have any borax? Salt, Peter. Don't. Well, that sucks. I just pulled you out of your out of your thing for nothing. I'm so sorry, dude. Uh. Have, have a nice day. I'm gonna go cut down some trees. I'm sorry. I get to chopping wood, but before too long, I start to shiver. I should have brought a torch with me to start a fire. I'm getting hypothermia. I could make a fire starter and build a campfire that way to warm up with, but my inventory's nearly full anyway, so I just head home. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Oh no. <laughs> oh man, it gets real cold out. Oh, my shirt's worn out. Shoot. I need better clothes. I set up a big charcoal pit and make a couple of extra iron hammers in the evening. I go through them real quick making all this iron chain. On day 73, I give the pigs the rest of my turnips. I'm running low on vegetables, but most of the pigs are almost pregnant now. Come on, little piggies. I have so little food left. Then I spend the rest of the day making more iron chain. I manage five more. Halfway there. I don't have the leather yet, though. On day 74, the pigs are all pregnant at last. The rest of the food is mine. All mine. Then it's another day of hammering out iron chain. I realize I actually don't need any leather for the helmet, so I go ahead and craft it up. So shiny. Day 75, I test out an idea for clearing out the snow more quickly. It does not work. I manually shovel out and cut some grass to make an armor stand, then tend to the animals, including gathering some eggs. Thank you. I plan to keep smithing, but a temporal storm comes in and disrupts my plans. All I get from it is four flax fibers, too. What a ripoff. On day 76, it finally occurs to me that making the leather for this armor will take a lot longer than smithing up the iron chain. I don't want to slaughter my pigs until they have their babies, but I look it up and apparently they take 25 days to give birth. That's longer than I have left. At long last, I realize I need to go out hunting. I head across the lake to the land of wild sheep and take down a handful of them before I realize, once again, that I didn't think to bring a torch, and it's very, very cold outside. Oh no, 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 I'm wet. Oh, that's bad. That's bad. I have to run back home. Still, I got seven hides soaking, and according to my math, after adding in what I already have, this will give me more than I need. I'll have armor soon. In about 10 days, when the leather is ready. When I wake up on day 77, I discover that the snow is gradually starting to melt. I guess it's getting warmer out already. I figure I should take the opportunity to go exploring for borax. I head northwest towards the areas with sedimentary rock. I'm annoyed to find that while the ice and snow are melting, the temperature isn't actually rising. The game seems to determine when to freeze and melt water based on the date and the base temperature of each block, rather than the actual temperature on a given day. So it can be well below freezing, yet there's open water everywhere just waiting for me to fall in and freeze. At least I remember to bring a torch this time. Boom! I don't spot any borax anywhere, but I'm poking my head into easily accessible cave entrances when I make a spectacular find. Yes! Hey, light. It's not what I need for steel, but these pink stones grind into salt, which I can use to preserve food. It's a bit late, but still, nice to have. I mine up a couple stacks, then realize it's getting late, and I need to head back home. I'll come back soon, though, to see if my luck in this area holds out. I spend the evening grinding up salt and getting some pickling started. On day 78, the snow has all melted, but I decide it's still too cold out to go searching for borax. I'm gonna leave it a few days to warm up a bit and spend some time making a greenhouse instead so I can get some early crops planted soon. I make a quick run south to grab some seeds from a loot vessel I marked on my big trip. Come on, pumpkin seeds. Come on, pumpkin seeds. Dang it! And dig up some terra preta. Ah. Then I remember that I have more stuff to get ready for steel making aside from just finding borax. I still need a pulverizer. I spend the night crafting all the parts. I'll need a load of quartz and bauxite too. Before bed, I put together my chain leggings. Yeah! Check me out! Iron chain leggings. One more part, and I got the full gear. The next day, I set up the pulverizer, then head south to dig up some quartz I spotted nearby. Unfortunately, it's right under the sand and gravel layer, which is hugely annoying. On the other hand, it contains gold. This is a really rare find. I spend most of the day mining up as much as I can. When I get home, the wind is blowing and the windmill is turning. I stand in the mill for hours and smash a stack each of bauxite and quartz to bits. I have no idea how much I actually need, but I figure this should give me a good start. Then I spend the rest of the night hunting drifters for flax. I only need four more fibers to craft more windmill sails, and I'd really like to be able to upgrade the mill. Yes! Oh, glorious flax! At 2am, I finally have enough. It's a massive improvement. 
Unfortunately, I look up how much pulverized bauxite and quartz I need, and it's, uh, it's, it's a lot. A real lot. Like, eight stacks of each. I don't have enough, so I spend half the day mining some more, then the evening and all through the night at the pulverizer. In theory, I could automate this, but it would take a lot of time and resources smelting up copper and hammering it into plates to make hoppers, and it's honestly faster to just do it manually for now. Anyway, it's pretty easy to get into a rhythm, and I don't mind doing it. Unfortunately, in the middle of the night, the wind dies, but more than half of it is done, and it'll take time to fire up the bricks and batches anyway. On day 81, I'm trying to fire more bricks, but it turns out I'm out of straw for the pit kilns, so I spend half the day cutting grass. Once the next batch is going, I realize this is really just going to take way too long. I need to expand the pit kiln operation. So I dig out some more temporary pits in the rest of the forge area. Oh yeah, this is going to work much better. I hope nothing terrible happens. Oh no, oh no, oh no! Oh no! Oh, I had leather going in there! Oh, that sucked! Oh, that sucked a lot! Oh, no! No, 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 no! No, 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 no! Oh, God, I'm on fire! Oh, God! Mistakes have been made! Mistakes have been made, folks! No, 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 no! Oh. It didn't do this before! It was fine before! Why, why now it is causing problems? What the heck? So it turns out that uh, fire can spread to barrels and chests. Lesson learned. Anyway, I realize I'm also going to need some mortar for the bricks, so I start cooking up some quicklime. It's a slow process. On day 82, I check the bees and discover that they've finally swarmed. I break two of the skeps and place three more, then run outside and laugh at the angry bees trapped in their little house. I work some more on the fire bricks and quicklime, and rearrange the pit kilns so they're less likely to, um, D destroy my base. By the way, placing the sticks in the pit kilns is the most satisfying sound I've ever heard. Yeah, that's the good stuff. I finish off the mortar, then I get to work making the six iron plates needed to make the iron door for the cementation furnace for steel. I also realize I don't have enough iron blooms for both the door and my armor, so I'll need to do another underwater mining run soon. I've gotten four of the six plates made by day 83, but I notice the wind has picked up and I run to the mill to smash more rocks into beautiful rock dust. By the end of the day, it feels like I must have close to enough, so I go ahead and start crafting up the bricks. It turns out I have more than enough, with spares to replace broken refractory bricks later. That's it. That's more than I need. I didn't need this many. I also make the coffin, so all that remains now is the last two plates for the iron door and, uh, borax. I still haven't found borax. So I finish up the last two iron plates on day 84, then head out to do some more mining. First I get another stack of hematite ore. I have to swim past some high-level drifters to get back out. Oh! Drifters! Kind. Deep drifters. Eee! Exactly what I was afraid of. After that, I head back up towards where I found the halite before, checking here and there with the prospecting pick to see if there are any good borax sites. Unfortunately, it seems like I accidentally hit my pause recording button at some point on this trip, and I didn't get any footage of this next part, so, um, please enjoy this reenactment made on a duplicate save. Okay. What about right here? Very poor borax. Why, that's the best I've found. I'm going to have to dig down down here and see if there's any borax down below. I sure hope I find some. Oh, oh, a cave. Oh, there's a cave here. Let's find a safe way in. I'd better I'd better put some some fences up in case there's any bad guys down here. And I'll just place tor torches as I go. And look this way first, because it's going upwards, and it scares me less, because there might be, um... Le less frightening drifters. There you go. Oh! Oh, look! There's some borax in the wall, right here. Definitely exposed, that I can see. Like, I like this one. I'll just mine, mine out all the borax I can find until I get a full stack of borax. 
however big of a space uh, that takes up. Oh, I've, I've got all the borax now. I've got all the borax I could ever need. I'm going to go back home. Back out the way I came. This is it. I have everything I need to make steel. Day 85. Only 15 days to go. How has the time flown by so fast? The clock is ticking. I'm down to eating moldy pies, but there's no time to get more food. I have to make steel. It turns out I actually need a lot more iron. I need an iron anvil to work the steel, which will take 10 ingots all by itself. Then another 16 ingots for the cementation furnace, not to mention all the charcoal. I spend day 85 setting up all the iron nuggets I have in bloomeries, then run to the iron mine again for another 5 stacks of ore. That ought to be enough for everything I need. Back home, I get those set up in bloomeries too, then start hammering out ingots. Day 86 is a, a big ol' iron day. I make the entire iron anvil, which is no small feat. This thing is huge, made in two parts from 5 ingots each, then you have to weld them together with borax. After that, I need to make 16 ingots for one batch of steel. Before anyone leaves an angry comment about how I should have set up a hell of hammer to automate this process, I looked into it, and given the weak wind speed at my base and all the work that goes into getting a hell of hammer running, it was definitely faster to just do it manually this time. Once they're ready, I realize I don't have enough charcoal, so I set up a charcoal pit with most of my remaining wood. While the charcoal burns, I build a cementation furnace. This includes killing all the animals in my little larder, since I need that hole to access the charcoal pile. It's been nice knowing you, friends. After a lunch of delicious red meat stew, I finish up the cementation furnace, including chiseling out a little charcoal holder below. When the charcoal is ready, the moment of truth arrives. I fill up the cementation furnace and start it burning. It's very exciting. Steel. Steel is on its way. I don't know how long it'll take, but surely it can't be that long. In the meantime, I cut down the walnut trees which have just grown now that the weather is heating up, and start most of them burning into more charcoal since the steel has taken almost all of what I had. Then I make the final pieces of iron chain for my armor. I have enough leather, and I finally make the chest piece. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness gracious. Look at this. Oh, heck yeah. Listen, listen to the jingle when I walk. That's those iron chains, baby. I am kitted out. And of course, it completely destroys all my other stats. I have got full iron armor for the first time ever since I started playing this game. This is awesome. Now that the steel is going, I turn my attention to the greenhouse. I spend day 88 working on that, using the beautiful walnut logs and glass. Unfortunately, I run out of glass, so I have to set up more quartz and bloomeries. I spend the rest of the day basically just tidying up and making the place look a little nicer. This is my home, after all. I take a break in the evening to read some of the lore books I found in the ruins. These unlock journal entries with bits of info about the world before the apocalypse. In the evening, I make some more oil lamps and place them around outside to cut back further on drifter spawns. Then I see that the charcoal has gone out in the cementation furnace. Steel! The steel is ready! Nineteen percent complete? Or not. Oh my Dang. god! I'm gonna need so much more charcoal. Oh my god! The glass is ready on day 89, so I finish up the greenhouse and plant some seeds inside. Onions to replenish my food stores and flax, of course. You always need flax. A few trees have sprung up around the base, so I chop them down and make another charcoal pit, then head out east to cut down even more trees. My axe gets perilously close to breaking, but I head home with a good amount of logs. I'd hope to have steel tools by now, but it looks like that'll be a little while yet, so I go ahead and make a new iron shovel and axe. Then it's another charcoal pit. I'm basically playing a waiting game now. Waiting for charcoal, waiting for steel. I'm not really sure what to do with myself. I could go adventuring with my new armor, but I don't want to go too far so I can keep an eye on things here. On day 90, I basically just do a lot of little chores. Dig up more charcoal, refill the cementation furnace, Decide it should be safe to plant crops outside again, but I'm confounded to discover that all the farmland is dry and barren. What's the deal with that? There was a ton of snow here and it didn't moisten the soil when it melted. Springtime is usually really wet. This is kind of ridiculous, actually. I decide to just dig up most of the soil and replace it with new blocks, except for the terra preta, which I don't want to lose. Then I make a watering can and set it firing. Unfortunately, just pouring water over the soil with a bucket doesn't work. <laughs> Zero percent moisture, huh? I plant a lot of seeds, including the sunflowers. I hope I'll get the chance to cook with them before my time is up. Then I do a little landscaping. I move the berry bushes out front. I check the steel, which has hit 50%. In the early hours of day 91, I get a warning of an impending temporal storm. I'd hoped to clean up the murder hole before the next and probably final storm, but now I don't have much time. I do my best to make it look nicer with some granite cobblestone, and it's not perfect, but it's certainly a big improvement. Yes. Yes. Yes! Party in the murder hole! Whoop! Hey! Oh, oh, would you look at the time? Is it... 
Is it stab a clock already? Woo! Time to stab. At the end of the storm, I only get a handful of flax and one single rusty gear. You know, I keep hearing people in the vintage story forums complain that it's too easy to cheese the storms and get a mountain of gears, but I have not had that sort of luck. Anyway, this should be the final storm, so that's a relief. I refill the charcoal in the cementation furnace and realize I might still not have quite enough to finish the process. I make a mental note to get more wood soon. Meanwhile, I remember that I have a watering can now and go moisten the rapidly drying fields. I'm not sure why they're drying out so fast. It's above freezing, and rain is meant to be common in this area. This whole system is wildly unrealistic. The ground should be very wet after the winter ends. Come on. Anyway, after that I cut up all the wood I have left and set it burning into more charcoal. I'm all prepared to go out on a tree chopping journey on day 92, but by morning it turns out a lot of the trees I've planted nearby have grown, so I just cut down those and use them for charcoal. The first batches of pickled vegetables are ready now, which is very exciting. <gasps> Pickles! Pickled onions, oh, so good. Did I mention I love pickles? Love them. Mm. I've also soaked the cassava I brought up from the south, but I'm a little confused about how to dry it out. I put some in my inventory and some in a clay vessel to see what happens. Then I tend to the crops and make a nice little area to sit in outside, using some of that beautiful purple heartwood. I'm basically just standing around waiting at this point, so I have nothing better to do than pan gravel to see what I can find. Actually, it turns out I can get zinc from panning, which is more helpful than it sounds. Zinc is used to make brass, which is needed to make torch holders. A torch holder or two would be really nice, as the torches placed in them never go out, and I always need a torch on hand for lighting fires. But I need 24 zinc nuggets to make a single one, and I'm not sure if I can manage that by the end of my 100 days. Day 93 is full of busy work. Tending to the crops, feeding the chickens, freeing some of the chickens from prison under their coop, which I'm not sure how they got inside. I consider saving the flax cloth I have, but at this point I don't really need it for anything else, so I make a nice chair for my little outdoor seating area. On day 94, I realize I'm gonna need some easy-to-carry food when I head south to gather my tropical crops in a couple of days. I bet you thought I forgot about that, but I have it marked on my calendar. So I spend the morning baking rye bread with the flour I saved from last year's harvests. 99%. Oh my god, it'll be done anytime. Ah! I'm waiting for it to be done. <laughs> then, at last, it happens. <gasps> it's done! It's done! I'll have to replace all the damaged bricks, but that's fine. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I'm not gonna take damage in here. Ow! It's still hot. It's still hot in there. Hey, everyone's still hot in there. Oh man. Okay. Yes. I'm going in. I don't care if I take damage. Okay, I'm not taking damage. I'm fine. Oh my goodness. 16 blister steel! The steel is done. I make a whole set of steel tools. Then I try making some food from the cassava, which is finally dry. I try out a few new recipes, a veggie pie and some bread. I like the color of this stuff. Then it's another night of sifting, praying for zinc, but it's not going well. Day 95 is the last day before I head south. I take a few items to sell to Hans and Rigby. Yes! Work it, Rigby. <gasps> Babies! Oh, the piglets are finally getting born! Yay! Yeah, sunflowers. Awesome. Back home, the sunflowers are growing, so I try making some sunflower bread. It looks so sad when they're ready to harvest. I'm disappointed that you get sunflower grain from the crops rather than seeds, and maybe some lovely flowers you could put in a pot, but the bread does look cool. I'm about ready for my trip at this point, so I spend the night sifting. This time I actually get some treasures, including a bit of jewelry, some lapis, and a gold nugget. But not nearly enough zinc. Whoa, what the hell? Ah! Mid sifting, some drifters climb over the fence and give me a jump scare. Turns out I put the cementation furnace coffin right up against the fence after gathering my steel. What? Oh god, the coffin! <sighs> that scared the hell out of me. Won't make that mistake again. I have some scrambled eggs for breakfast on day 96 and start running south. It's a pretty uneventful journey and my crops are ripe when I reach my southern farm. I consider hanging around to gather more resources while I'm here, but honestly I have too much to do back home, so I gather up a bunch of tropical flowers and start heading north right away. I make it as far as the redwood forest and sleep in my bed to avoid having to deal with too many drifters. It was probably kind of foolish to bring the aged bed with me. The nights are short this time of year and I definitely lost a few hours of daylight. 
I wake up on May 1st and celebrate one year of gameplay by killing a few drifters. Then I grab some redwood logs and run the rest of the way back home without incident. When I get home, the leather is ready, so I make my final backpack. Almost all my crops have grown, so I do some harvesting. I throw some cabbage into my leftover brine to make sauerkraut, one of my favorite treats. Sauerkraut. I plant all the tropical seeds now that it's warm out. I repair the broken refractory bricks in the cementation oven, although I probably won't be using it again. Then I start getting some things together for a trip to the caves. I've been cowering in my base for too long. I have a full set of armor and steel tools now. It's time to go caving at last. Alright. I got all my tools. I got some bread. Actually, I'm gonna grab the rest of my bread. Alright. I got all my tools. Some bread, some extra bread, two stacks of torches, a stack of ladders, a stack of wooden fences, and some fence gates in case I need them, and my chain armor. Oh, healing. Healing. I need healing. Alright. Hopefully, that'll be enough healing. Hopefully, I won't need healing. Because I'm gonna kick all these dudes' butts. Why are there so many drifters? Ugh, I don't wanna deal- I'm going out the back, I don't wanna deal with them. There's nobody out here. Oi. Just gonna run past. See ya! I'm slightly terrified. I gotta be honest. I, uh... I'm not good at the fighting in this game. I am afraid of all the noises that the monsters make. Uh, this is gonna be a scary experience for me, but I have no more excuses. This is... I'm as prepared as it is possible to be after a hundred days of gameplay. I've got iron armor, steel sword. I mean... I'm, I'm probably gonna be fine. I just gotta face my fear. And, uh, see if I can find anything cool in the bottom of the caves. Oh man, I feel like maybe I didn't bring enough food. Rigby! This may be the last time I see you, I might be about to die. Can we boogie one last time? I'm gonna miss you, buddy. I don't- I don't know if I'm coming back out of this. So let's boogie one last time. What, you can't even face me? That's a pretty good move. A little treadmill. Alright, I'm going. Wish me luck, buddy. I'm gonna go to the hole that I found the tin in. Okay. Gearing up. I'm so nervous, folks. I'm real scared. What's the sound my armor makes? Chink a chink. Chink a chink a chink. Oh, there could very well be drifters in here. I'm gonna block this off. Right? That's what we brought the fences for. Yep. There's, uh... Oh my goodness, the way they light stuff up. Oh, they're coming, they're coming. Right, they can't get to me now. Pretty sure they can climb the ladders. This. Oh, there's scary drifters down there as well. Okay. Oh, this is so terrifying. It is cool how they light up, though. Oh. He's taking da Are they fighting each other? Or is he taking damage from walking over the spikes? Okay. I don't think they can reach me. Can I reach them? Oh, there's a whole bunch of these dudes. I can get them with a the spear, okay. They're just deep drifters, that's not too bad. Stop moving. Ah, oh, Jesus. I like little spiders. Oh, there's so many of the locusts. Anybody can reach me. Good sound effects on these guys. I think the locusts, are the the drifters, are killing themselves. Wow, Jesus! Ah, Jesus! Ah, <laughs> face hugger! Oh my God, they can jump! Oh God, is that a bell one?
That's the scariest noise I've ever heard in my life. Okay, hold up. I need to regroup here. Oh my god. I can't face all of these. That's the most terrifying sound I've ever heard in my life. Look at that thing. Like, it's one thing to see them in the murder hole. It's another thing to see them... Like this. I can, like, block off this area. Ah. Uh, that guy is... Oh, he's dead. I'm not too worried about the locust. I think with my... I'm just using a bronze spear now. If I use a sword, they should be pretty easy to take care of. It's the bell that I'm almost scared of. And these dudes are coming up from the depths. I'm wasting like half the day just standing here. If I just run around placing torches and then run back to the ladder, am I gonna die? I feel like I might. Obviously, I don't want to run over these spikes. They're clearly bad. Locust nest. I can break this. Oh my god. Okay. Ooh, drop stuff. I'm gonna have to be brave. I just- I don't wanna die so close to the end. No, 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 you go away! I gotta- I gotta just go for it. I just go for it. Okay, that actually died pretty quickly. I'm not taking a lot of damage. Okay. How am I doing? I have not taken much damage, actually. Alright, I might be okay. The armor is definitely helping. I'm gonna... My hands are, are literally shaking. I'm gonna... Ooh, I'm taking a lot of, a lot of damage. Okay. That was too much. That was too much. <sighs> okay. Folks, I cannot emphasize how scared I am of this. These do so little. That guy's over there. I kill these drifters. Nope. 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 Oh no! Okay. Oh man, I'm so slow in this armor. Alright. Uh, I want to go block off that other tunnel over here. Finally, I get the area cleared out and as safe as it can be. I get a lot of loot from breaking the locust nests and cages, including some metal parts. Those would be useful if I got lucky enough to find a broken translocator, but I didn't bring any temporal gears with me. Ah well, it's extremely unlikely that I'll find one anyway. Finally, I pick a direction and move onward. Ooh, bismuth. Ruins. <gasps> oh my god! For real! Sure enough, there's a translocator right there. Absolutely unbelievable. One final time, the luck of this world blesses me with an incredible find. I do need three temporal gears to repair it though, so I head back up and run home. Once the sun is up, I head back to the translocator with my three temporal gears and repair it. This thing will teleport me to another location in the world. The location is randomly chosen the first time the translocator is used, so I have no idea what awaits me. Oh god, I hope three is enough. Yes, yes. Ho! Oh. Let's turn it on. Oh my goodness. This is actually a little terrifying. Okay. Bread. Okay. So when I get out on the other side, I will probably be in a little room like this attached to a cave. So I'm gonna wanna throw down fences right away, just in case there's big scary drifters, because it's gonna be pretty deep underground. Where this takes me is completely random. 
It could be anywhere in the map. So, um... Here it goes. Here we go! Well, turns out this one is taking me ridiculously far south. So far that it breaks my map when I try to look around it. This thing really needs a jump to current location button or something. I dig my way out without incident. Ugh! Oh god! Well, without serious incident. I'm in a hot area with a bit of desert, although there's a mysterious thunderstorm while I'm there. I grab some saguaro fruit from the cactus growing there and poke around a bit, but there's not much for me to do with the time I have left, so I head back home, saying goodbye to Rigby on the way. Rigby, my friend. I'm heading home and I won't be coming back. This is the end of my hundred days, you see. So, um... One last dance, buddy? One last dance. <laughs> Back home, it's time to tie up some loose ends. I say hello to all the newborn piglets in the barn. I plant some lovely corn flowers I found along the way. I smelt up my gold nuggets into a single beautiful gold bar. I break one of the populated skeps in the bee house and use the wax for one more lantern for the garden. I make some pineapple jam and cassava pineapple saguaro pie. I make one last set of sails for my windmill and upgrade it again. As the sun rises, I realize that while I've accomplished almost all of my goals, there's one thing I've yet to do. Day 100, the final day, I have just one goal. Find and kill a wolf. I won't gear up completely in my armor since that feels a bit unfair, but I do put on my chain leggings to protect me against ankle bites. I think the nearest area that might have wolves is up to the northwest, so I head in that direction. And sure enough, I spot a wolf. I'm nervous. These things terrify me. I've been killed by them so many times before in other saves. To those of you who haven't played Vintage Story, please understand, these evil beasts will track you down from like 20 blocks away and leap out at you from the darkness. But this one must have eaten recently, so it only attacks when I get close. I take a bit of damage, but after one hit, the wolf takes off, and I have to chase it down to kill it. Oh god, it's faster than me. I did it! I have to say, I don't feel good about this, but the deed is done. The wolf is dead. I killed the wolf. Everyone can stop writing your angry comments. I did it. <sighs> killed this magnificent beast while it was fleeing in terror. I think I might be a monster. And then I get a warning that a heavy temporal storm is incoming. Perfect. I spend the day tidying up, munching on the delicious tropical food I made, and just peacefully enjoy the beautiful home I've made for myself. When the time comes, I head to the murder hole, now kitted out with the spikes I looted from the locust nests, for one last storm. Because it's a heavy storm, all the enemies are high level, corrupt and nightmare drifters. The first group spawns right at the edge of the murder hole and one of them nearly kills me before jumping in. I should have worn my armor. But the rest of the storm, I stay far from the edges and I don't take any more hits. When the storm finally ends, I get a decent amount of flax fiber and a single rusty gear. I make my way out of the hole and go check on the chickens, who are fine. Everybody okay? <laughs> Eggs everywhere. Oh wow, all the desks are full. <laughs> then a nightmare drifter oh. comes around the corner. I'll wear my armor. Ah! Whoo! Oh 
I'm going inside. The sun is setting. After calming down, I climb up to the roof of the barn to watch one last sunset and reflect on all I've accomplished. I almost just died. In the final moments of my final day, I almost just died. But I didn't. I didn't die. I made it. I made it all the way to the end. 100 days, folks. 100 days in vintage story. Once it's dark, I realize that I am so, so tired. Nothing to do now, but get some sleep. Good night, folks. Hi, thanks so much for watching my 100 days in vintage story. In the end, I did pretty well. I accomplished most of my goals. I survived, I made a full set of metal armor and steel tools, I bred all three of the farm animals, and I collected almost every farmable seed in the game. The only one I missed was pumpkins, and to be fair, those can only be found as a random drop from seed vessels, so well, it was not too bad. So this video took me over a year to make. I started recording at the end of July 2021, and I'm wrapping up the editing at the start of August 2022. A lot of things have changed in my life over the past year. Uh, I moved to a new flat, started a new job, and I had major surgery a few months ago, which I'm still not fully recovered from. And all the while, I was picking away at this video in the background. On the screen right now, you are currently seeing the names of all of my patrons. I've included not only my current patrons, who have patiently stood by me while I slowly completed this video, but also all of my former patrons. Because this video was such a big project for me, and because it took so long, I wanted to make sure that everyone who's ever given me support got a proper thank you. I cannot tell you how much it means to me that so many people have seen fit to support my work. Aside from early access to this video, and having their names in the credits, all of my current patrons will also get access to the final save of my game, as well as a compilation of all of my game footage from this entire playthrough. That's about 30 hours of pure, unnarrated gameplay for anyone who wants to see the entire 100 days. And that brings me to an announcement. Now that this big project is finally complete, I'm gonna be stepping away from making videos for a while. But don't worry, I'm not gonna stop making things. But I'll be shifting my focus from playing and talking about games to making them. I've made a few small games in the past, which you can find on secretfoxfire.itch.io, but I've found that since I have a job and a home to manage, I don't really have the time to both make videos and games. And for the time being, I wanna focus on the games. But if you really just want to watch me play games, I stream every Saturday at 8pm Central European Time on twitch.tv slash secretfoxfire. That's 7pm in the UK and 2pm in the East Coast of North America. At the moment, I'm playing Elden Ring with a lovely boy called Perry the Pigeon Man. If you can't make it live, I archive all the stream VODs here on this channel, so you can watch them whenever it's convenient for you. So about my games. If you like logic puzzles, narrative games, escape rooms, or ARGs, you'll probably enjoy what I'm working on. My patrons will still have private game servers to play on, Vintage Story and Minecraft, and they'll be resetting soon, so now's the perfect time to get in on those. But my main focus for my patrons right now is going to be behind-the-scenes updates on the games I'm making. Patrons will also be invited to test and give feedback on games before they're released, and get free copies of premium games that I put on itch. Check out patreon.com slash secretfoxfire for more details on that. Thanks for sticking around to the very end of the video. Uh, I should reward you somehow. Um, hold on. Meep says he loves you. Say hello, Meep. Say hello. Hello, everybody. Thanks for watching. Are you grumpy? I'm gonna go put him back. <laughs>